Paul Stevens studies both the energy sector and the economic performance of countries producing energy. Unfortunately, the meeting point of these two topics has often been described as the resource curse. Paul, welcome to Raw Talks. Pleasure to be here. Could you just give a brief explanation of what the resource curse is about? The resource curse is a simple idea. If you get uh, large oil revenues or revenues from any mineral, then theoretically you should be better off. Uh, money can't buy you happiness, but it's a good down payment. But in reality, looking at the reaction of countries to large oil revenues, it has generally been very negative. And what it's done is tend to damage other sections of the economy. It also has political implications in terms of supporting uh, repressive regimes. The resource curse theory tries to explain why resource-rich nations tend to do worse than others, and there are several explanations to this. One such explanation blames poor governance and poor institutions in these countries. Over the past 10-15 years, policymakers have responded uh, with a great deal of research and targeted initiatives. How has that gone? You're quite right to say that there's a lot of research gone into looking at the subject. And we now really understand what causes resource curse, but understanding it is not the same as being able to cure it. So, for example, the main cause of resource curse is poor governance and poor institutions. So what do you do about that? I mean, it's like saying to somebody who's bad, please be good. It's not necessarily going to have any impact. So although we know why countries get resource curse, countries still get resource curse because they don't have the institutional capacity to be able to do something sensible about the problems they face. So it's basically a catch-22. They don't have the institutional capacity to build institutional capacity. Precisely. And this... This is the basis of the problem, because how do you break out of that? Well, you get good institutions, but how do you get good institutions? And this is where much of the research has been aimed at, is trying to understand how bad institutions can become better institutions. Do you see the poor governance being part of the resource curse agenda moving forward as well? Would that be the main focus? Yes, I think it would have to be the main focus. I mean, there are other factors as well of a technical nature to do with uh, exchange rates and macroeconomic policy and these sorts of things. And again, that's well understood. But if the government uh, consists of a bunch of thieves, a kleptocracy, then clearly in those circumstances, uh, they're not going to do the right thing. You have a beautiful phrase uh, when you're describing the resource curse, and you refer to the illusion of prosperity. This is something that you say is experienced by resource-rich nations. What do you mean by this illusion of prosperity? The best way of explaining it is to look at the situation when a country announces it's made a large oil discovery. And immediately, the media in that country are full of wonderful things to come. They're going to be the next Kuwait. Everybody's going to have gold bath taps. In other words, expectations rise to enormous levels. And the problem is the reality is a very different. So the, the complication is that you think you're rich, uh, but in reality you're not rich. So how do you manage those expectations? With great difficulty. And this is where the media in the country has to play a responsible role. The government has to be able to say to people, look, you know, we will be better off as a result of this discovery, but we're not going to turn ourselves into a, in, in, into a very wealthy society and everybody will live happily ever after. But it's crucial that those expectations are managed early on. What is the role of the resource developer in, in managing those expectations? This is a good question. Um, ideally, it's the responsibility of the government to manage these expectations. But very often, the governments lack the capacity to do that. And one of the things the companies can do is to help the government develop the capacity to do the right thing, to do the sorts of things they need to be doing as governments. So giving support to the government rather than taking action themselves. Yes, it's not really the role of companies to, to, to sort of take over the role of government, but they can certainly assist governments by helping them develop the necessary capacities. And what we see in, in some of these nations uh, trying to deal with this is uh, state intervention, high public expenditure and fiscal deficit. In the last decade, the exact same symptoms we've seen in agricultural producing nations. Are they also exposed to the resource curse? 
not in the same way as you are with hydrocarbons and minerals. And the reason for this is very simple. Uh, there is no economic rent or very little economic rent and in agricultural What do you mean by that? But economic rent is the difference between the full cost of producing something and the market price. You can think of it in terms of profitability, if you like. There's a lot more profit in hydrocarbons and minerals than there is in agricultural uh, product. Having more income from agriculture is not necessarily going to have the same impact as having more income from, from hydrocarbons and minerals. And that is the same between oil and mining? Yeah, although again, there is probably more economic rent, or at least there was more economic rent in oil, because in oil you have OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, who basically been manipulating markets or trying to manipulate markets to keep prices well above the cost of production. In light of all the risks associated with the resource curse, some have proposed that potential new producers should consider leaving the resources in the ground, and you are one of those proponents. But I wonder, is this a feasible scenario in the real world? The answer is no, because somebody out there, some company out there will come in and develop the resource, whether it's good for the country or not, because the only thing they're interested in is maximizing return to the shareholders. And so in those circumstances, it's not very realistic to say, just leave it in the ground. However, what you can say to governments is slow the development of the resource, because the key to successful use of the resource is to ensure that your economy is diversifying away from dependence on that particular resource. But is slow development, is that feasible? I mean, there's pressure on pol politicians to, do, to, to get fast results. Yes, of course, and it is, it's not necessarily going to be easy. I come back to the idea of expectations being raised when a discovery is made. But the reality is it really is the responsibility of governments to make sure that the resource is not developed too quickly because the key to successful development is to diversify the economy. To diversify the economy, you need to maximize linkages between the resource se sector and the rest of the economy. To maximize those linkages takes time. You have to build up the capacity. So the slower you can develop the resource, then the sooner the country will be able to develop the necessary capacities. Some talk about uh, diversification as being dependent on one commodity, but moving away to other commodities as well. What other talks about diversification as moving completely away from commodities and commodity dependence. What, what is your view? Well, the ideal situation would be to move completely away from commodities. But again, this is not terribly realistic. You can hardly expect some third world countries to rapidly develop high-tech industry, for example. So it depends really upon what your factor endowments are as to what is feasible. Is there any country that has done well in this area? Yes, there are. I mean, that are what I call my usual suspects, and that is countries like Norway, Botswana, Chile, Malaysia, and Indonesia. The problem is that the way, the reason that they did particularly well is very specific to the country. And so they're not necessarily a model for other countries to follow. For example, uh, the best example is Norway. The only way you can reproduce the Norwegian experience is to start with five million Norwegians. Otherwise, it's just not going to happen. So you have to take into account the local circumstances. So generalizations are practically impossible. All generalizations are wrong, if you'll forgive me making a generalization. Let us look at the energy sector in particular. The price of oil has huge implications for economic development, both for producing nations and consuming nations. Yet, it used to be quite arbitrarily defined by a small group of producers. Is the oil price today a more accurate reflection of supply-demand forces? I think the short answer to that is yes, but it needs a little bit of explanation. Please. Uh, since 1928, the oil price was determined because a group of men in a room said a number, and so long as enough people outside the room believed in that number, that was the oil price. And of course, the men in the room were the oil companies. Then in the 1980s, they moved away from this administered price, but they administered supply instead. So it was still in a, a controlled administered market. Then in November 2014, when OPEC decided they weren't going to cut, in other words, they weren't going to interfere in the marketplace, the oil price was then determined for the first time since 1928 by supply and demand. And the result of this, of course, was the collapse in oil prices. So from that point of view, oil prices have been, for the last few years, been determined by, by supply and demand. 
Now, at the end of last year, 2016, uh, they tried to restore control over supply when they came to the an OPEC agreement. Countries. The OPEC countries came to an agreement between themselves, but also with non-OPEC countries as well. It's very doubtful if that agreement is going to have any significance because the history of people cheating on those sorts of agreements is very strong indeed. So at the moment, the oil price in the market is determined by supply and demand factors. Now, one of the greatest developments and most significant developments is the U.S. coming online as a major producer. What implications has that had on the oil sector? It's had two implications. First of all, it's increased supply in a market that was already oversupplied, and hence the collapse in oil prices. But it also has another significance as well. U.S. production has changed the economics of oil supply. If you look at conventional oil, the lead time on projects is five to ten plus years. For shale oil, tight oil in the United States, the lead time is a matter of months. Now, what this means is... That's quite is a significant difference. It, it's a tremendous difference. And what it's done is to increase the elasticity of supply. In other words, the responsiveness of supply to prices. So as prices start to increase, if they start to increase, supply will respond very quickly, choking off that increase in supply. So this has been a very major change in the international oil industry. Does it mean that the Middle East has lost relevance? It's not lost relevance because that's where all the cheap oil still is. But certainly it means that their ability to control the market is much reduced. Low oil prices stimulate the global economy. While not at historic lows, uh, prices are still a fraction of what it used to be a decade ago. However, you have warned against cheap oil. Why is that? For several reasons. First of all, if the oil price goes very low, a number of oil producing countries find themselves in very severe financial problems. And most of these countries need revenue in order to keep the kids out of the streets and off the squares, in other words, to try and contain domestic political unrest. In a very low oil price world, they're not able to do this, and so it's quite likely that you can see all sorts of political problems domestically in these countries. So the turmoil in, say, the Middle East, um, North Africa, and the refugee crisis, is that connected to low oil prices? It's certainly linked into it in terms of the ability of governments to offset the sort of domestic concerns of their population. We discussed the reasons for current low prices, basically down to technology and geopolitics. In your view, is this cyclical or are we heading towards a longer period of cheap oil? You could certainly make the argument that over the last 30 or 40 years there has been a cycle. But I think that cycle has now broken, not least because of the shale technology revolution that I've already referred to and the fact that uh, oil prices now, as they start to rise, will produce supply fairly rapidly. So the old cycle, I think, has been broken largely as a result of the change in technology. But that must have implications for the industry. It has huge implications for the industry because a lot of people in the industry still believe they're in a cycle. And they're all sitting there waiting, waiting for the oil price to go back up again. Now, the oil price may well go back up again, particularly if there's some geopolitical upheaval. But absent a geopolitical upheaval, it's going to be a long time, if ever, before we see prices going back to the sort of levels we saw four or five years ago. You have said that um, the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones, and the Oil Age will not end because we run out of oil. Why will it end, then? I wish I had said that. That wasn't me. That was Zaki Yamani, who was the oil minister of Saudi Arabia. It's but a I, clever, I, I, clever one. It, it's a very nice one, and I completely agree with what he said. He said this when people were going on about the concept of peak oil, that suddenly we were going to run out of oil supplies. In reality, that is not likely to happen. However, there are other explanations as to why we will move away from oil. Any energy transition, an energy transition is when an economy moves from one dominant source of energy to another, is usually driven by relative prices. Now, as far as oil is concerned, I don't think the price of oil is going to rise because of scarcity. But the technological changes we've seen, and particularly the issue of demand as a result of COP21, the Paris Agreement, concerns about climate change, means that demand is likely 
as we go forward to not be as high as people so expect. It will be a decision by consumers to move away from oil. Absolutely. And consumers driven by governments. So I come back to my point about relevant pri uh, relative prices. I'm thinking here particularly if a carbon price is introduced, that will encourage people not just to move away from coal, but also from oil as well. Does this mean that oil nations will end up with stranded assets? It's very likely that they will. Those countries that have very large oil reserves uh, are going to find themselves sitting on oil reserves that basically nobody wants. Now, this is not going to happen in the next couple of years, but if you're taking a time frame of 5 to 10 to 15 years, that, then I think that is highly probable. So 5 to 10, 15 years, is that the time frame then the countries have to diversify? Yes, and it's a very short period of time. And the reality is that they should have started that process 40 years ago. Who are lagging behind? Uh, virtually all of them. They all made rhetorical noises about moving away from oil, but none of them have really done so. They're now starting in the last year or so to look at, the, look at this as a serious issue. But frankly, they are too late. Raw talks will not end because we run out of things to talk about, that's for sure, but uh, we have run out of time. So I want to say thank you very much for joining Raw Talks, Paul. Thank you very much, I enjoyed it. And to keep up with the new debate on extractives and development, join us on rawtalks.org. <laughs>